I mm. can totally understand why that would be soul crushing as though I, you know, you have one of the greatest jobs in the world and that just that then turns into something where you're just an aggregator. That's that, that's your only value is to try to create maybe maybe get clicks if you're lucky. Uh, no, that's a, that's a deeply unhealthy way to to live and to work. And it's ultimately not a successful way to sustain a publication. So digital media publications are dropping left and right these days. BuzzFeed News is gone. Gawker died for the second time and Vice just filed for bankruptcy. Now, this isn't tech news specifically, but it is impacted by tech with new media startups adopting tech's VC field approach to rapid scaling, as well as their successful batting average uh, and sinking or swimming based upon the priorities of big tech's algorithms. And more pointedly, this podcast you're consuming right now is produced by a digital media publication, one more than 10 years old that has lived three different lives, first as a post-media publication, then relaunched as a Canadian-focused tech publication by an independent media company when it was originally shut down, and then spun out once again as its own company. So this is of personal and professional interest to me. I have been working in digital media, new media, web media since about 2004. The publications that have recently gone under, while not necessarily ones that I aspired to, were certainly peers on what felt like a new frontier. Well, the problem with frontiers is that you never actually hit the horizon. And when the sun sets, it's only darkness. So as the old new way of doing things dies off, what comes along to replace it? ChatGPT? Is that what you people want? I can't help but think that if BetaKit was launched in 2023 rather than 2012, we would be a Substack, a YouTube channel, and a podcast. But before we talk about what comes next, we need to hold awake for the dead. Joining me to do that today is Jonathan Goldsby, news editor at Canada Land. He is familiar with these types of wakes. Let's dig in. Jonathan, we're going to get right into this. Sure. Why are so many digital media publications dying left and right? And maybe why are they all dying in this same window? It's a very, it's a very good question. And I think if people had all the answers, then they hopefully would have been able to avert those deaths or at least build publications that would be more, would have been more sustainable or resilient. But if I had to guess why now, or if I had to, well, more than guess, if I had to surmise why now, it's because a lot of these publications, a lot of the, lot, well, a lot of the ones that are closing around now, and were like Vice is going to sale in bankruptcy, BuzzFeed News is shuttered. It's because they all, at least in their current iterations, started around the same time, about just a little over a decade ago, um, all trying to ride the same wave of social clicks basically and using the startup using the startup model that had proved so successful for facebook and twitter and well facebook more so than than twitter uh and trying to apply that and this venture capital approach to media and scaled up very very fast around the same time we were able to take advantage of facebook's algorithms to get incredible views and incredible clicks and then found that that wasn't a long-term recipe for success. I mean, we're all at the whims of Facebook and Google and, you know, just slight changes to their algorithm can completely screw over a given business or yeah. change an enterprise. Or, right? or yeah. federal laws that might remove those uh, uh, platforms from serving up news media, things like yeah, that. Yeah, I, I mean, once again, like Facebook, I mean, if we were going to want to get into to, to the, yeah, the Canadian regulations, I mean, Facebook is already... S for, for large publications, Facebook is already such a marginal distribution platform that actually, I mean, that's probably not fair to say, but I don't think I don't think that would be on there. Like we're talking about like BuzzFeed and Vice, what the legislation is in Canada would not affect um, would not have affected them. Like I don't think that'll have a huge impact on thing on larger publications. Okay, I want to go back to the the venture idea in a bit, but we should. This is also happening at a time like it's it's well uh, taken as a point to me that all of the publications that are currently uh, dying off, falling apart, uh, being sold for parts, all launched of a similar age. But this mm -hmm. is also happening at the exact same time 
uh, or or parallel to the ongoing mm-hmm. death of media publications yes. uh, across North America, mm-hmm. uh, depending on what you're looking at. It's somewhere like 3,000 publications just in the U.S. alone since 2004. Mm. I don't have the Canadian numbers in front of me, but I know um, your publication has reported on Mm. many deaths of Canadian papers Mm -hmm. and even some um, publication swaps between Mm -hmm. um, our private equity media overlords in certain Mm -hmm. instances. Where Before we get into the venture stuff, how do you connect what's happening at BuzzFeed and Gawker? to just the current state of media as a business? I mean, these places that went out so spectacularly and so quickly were also the ones that were built up so quickly. And what largely what they tried to do is they tried to move in on... Actually, let's let's, let's zoom out a little bit. Um, The reason media for most of the 20th century, the most reason news media was reasonably successful or reasonably sustainable in the first place, the biggest reason is because they had monopolies on the respective various forms of advertising, right? Mm. There weren't a lot of ways to for people to get a message out distributed widely other than your local newspaper, other than a radio ad, rather than a TV ad. And I'm talking, talking about like business advertising as well as classified advertising. That was a huge support. That was a huge element of newspaper revenues. And so as soon as the internet became widely adopted and there became much easier, cheaper, faster ways for people to not just sell products, but simply to communicate with each other, that bubble basically burst. This thing, this thing that had underwritten and supported uh, media because they once again had the monopoly on means, on basically means of mass communication. Uh, there was not a, there was nothing on the same scale to replace it. And very few places have managed to successfully shift uh, their models to become nearly as sustainable. I mean, things had subscriber bases, but that was never enough. And then with the course, with, with, you know, information on the internet being free. Mm-hmm. Um, and, assumed assumed mm-hmm. free and assumed. often approached as uh, should be free. You know? No, yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, in trying to whether in trying to figure what's the correct model there between distributing just distributing content and getting the most clicks possible versus trying to entice online subscribers, unless you're something like you know the New York Times, which manages to attract subscribers via. I mean, like I upgraded my subscription recently because I wanted to get wire cutter in the product reviews. I wanted mm-hmm. to get the access to New York Times games. I wanted to get, well, I don't read the athletic, uh, the, the, the recipes, like all the, the, the things that are able to package news alongside other kinds of products that people are also willing to pay for. That's always been the way to, that's another way to, to float it. But very few places have the scale or the diversity of operations to be able to create multiple products yeah. that people want to pay for to support the one that maybe they could get an alternative free. Yeah, that's really interesting because when we're talking about uh, BuzzFeed or Vice or Gawker, mm. we're, uh, and, and I guess maybe putting them in comparison to the the broader media death, mm-hmm. I think most of those publications that have been dying since 2004 have been uh, predominantly print publications, but they've also mm-hmm. been local publications. Mm-hmm. And the, the digital media publications that we're talking about that are, are failing, we're always trying to be of a national or international... Larger. For the, for the for the most part, I mean, there definitely have been local sites, local publications, local networks. I mean, there was the whole Gothamist network. I think Gothamist is still around, but all the sites, the other city blogs, like Torontoist and Toronto, and mm-hmm. I'm not sure what the state of like Chicagoist, LAist, Sydneyist at one time they had Londonist. I don't know what the states of those are, and so to the extent that so there were there were efforts at local sites, no no one was really able to do it, or very few people. Were able to do it successfully at a local level or just local level. Blogtio, for example, Toronto has or did manage to do it, but you're not doing that. But when you do have that, you're not doing it as once again. You're finding things other than news to make it work. It's mm. not. It's not running. Blogtio is at best a you know SEO optimized restaurant finder with some you know aggregated news releases on the side. Yeah, tied um, into the algorithms we were talking about before that perform well. 
um, you know, I just saw, mm-hmm. I believe it was a Blogtio article. And I, I, this isn't to mm-hmm. shit on Blogtio or other publications because I, I coming from a web media background, mm-hmm. uh, producing things that were high performing within certain algorithms or, or platforms, mm-hmm. it was, if not a point of pride, certainly not a point of shame. But mm-hmm. just, um, I think on my way here today, seeing a Blogtio article of like, uh, Toronto is changing a subway stop and people are already confused. And that is just purpose driven, yep. designed not really to convey information, but to convey interest to mm-hmm. uh, serve abs- an ad. Ab- to, exactly. Yeah. Abstract, just enough abstract sentiment or promise of sentiment to be able to entice a click. Um, but Blockchain actually maybe is a good example because they did have that a very brief experiment in 2019 called Fresh Daily, where they tried mm-hmm. to launch a national publication. And it originally, it, there was maybe some different ideas about what it was supposed to be, but at least one of the impressions of, of the intentions was to do ambitious journalism. And that lasted to basically two weeks, or I think it was two weeks, maybe it was one week. That lasted, mm-hmm. It lasted less than a month. Um, as soon as the publisher realized that it didn't scale the same way, you can't do original reported pieces, you know, an individual can't write, you know, five to 10 original reported pieces per day. It takes a lot more time. You're not going to get that many more clicks for original news. It's vastly more expensive to produce. Um, and why, you know, th- just it, that this was totally antithetical to the model they'd built up. And you saw it as it just seemed like a drain on the resources or a drag, right? right? Yeah, that, maybe it's useful for us to take a step back and talk this through because, again, I, I'm i very interested in inside baseball mm-hmm. conversations. Mm-hmm. We're coming at this for an audience that yeah. consumes us as a digital media publication. Mm-hmm. Um but I'm often struck, uh, particularly in this last week, because we just ran a 4,000 word feature that we had one reporter on for a full month, like to the day from start great. to finish, uh, at, at great cost to not only the rest of our publication mm-hmm. schedule, but like the the team. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't think uh, our audience fully understands the effort that goes into something like that. Every journalist that messaged us about this story was like, God, how, how long did that take? And every reader of our story that commented was like, wow, that one number Mm -hmm. (laughs) was really big. I don't know if audiences today understand consciously the difference between the blog TO, the New York Mm -hmm. Times, Globe and Mail, Canada Land or others. Like, I know they see it in terms of different brand perspectives, Mm -hmm. but in terms of format and approach. And I know you had done um, a, a podcast on mm-hmm. Canada Land last year about the the kind of the, the death of uh, Now mm-hmm. Magazine, right? Um, and one of the interesting things that stood out to me in that conversation that you had was that your guest was speaking to how difficult it was for the new expectation of employees at Now to file two stories a day, mm-hmm. which I think for most uh, average people would be a surprise that that is an issue, but also coming from a a web media perspective mm-hmm. for certain publications that I've been working for since like 2004, mm-hmm. coming from a, a blog environment, mm-hmm. um, the idea that that would be difficult, really? I think points to maybe not a tension, but like a, a disconnect or a difference in perspective and approach between traditional media publications and mm-hmm. then digital media publications. Because even reporters at... Uh, BuzzFeed or Vice, beyond the pure investigative stuff, we're probably looking to do more reactive content at that at that cadence, right? So I'm wondering if we could even just walk know. through I mean, the different types of sure. formats and distinctions here. I would say it's extremely difficult to do good to do original reporting multiple times a day. It's not a new thing. I mean, publications like the Toronto Sun or the various things mm-hmm. that they've always had uh, the model where people are expected to churn out a lot of quick stories. But I mean, that's, those are not necessarily high quality stories. Those are often going to be rewriting a press release that you may have time for one interview conducted by email. Mm-hmm. You're not basically churning up. It's very difficult to turn up original information or original perspectives or anything on on a consistent basis at that clip. Like, yeah, I mean, I was at Now Magazine. There was like one day I got like three things up. But like, it's not to to be able to do that every day is not just exhausting. But I mean, it's I mean, I, at best, it, or I would be. I guess I would say blogging in the um, 
the very early sense of the term where you're offering a quick take that's maybe the length of two tweets, mm. right? I mean, to, to me, my own personal thing, and this is something as a writer and very much when I was, you know, more editing, more written work at Candleland, like I really strongly believe that any sort of article or news story should have more, should, shouldn't, you shouldn't be, a, shouldn't be able to summarize in a tweet. It should have more than one tweet's worth of information. That's okay. So this, I, I love this because there's a whole generation and I feel like I'm part of it, mm -hmm. uh, of people that would say that that, that attitude was outdated and needed to be replaced by these new web media entities where, uh, the hot take, the quick reaction, um, not looking necessarily to do, uh, original reporting per se, but original perspectives, original commentary. Thing, the idea, the, the ability to do that well on a consistent basis and at that frequency is extremely rare, right? Like anyone Agreed. can have opinions and have reactions like to any, any given stimulus that's put in front of them, but to be able to articulate something that's actually adds anything to anything that's actually worth reading that's or something that's even funny or, or interesting or let alone original, to be able to do that on a consistent basis is... And to do that well is extremely difficult. Like, I think it's even something like writing a newspaper column. To actually write a newspaper column, you'd think writing a column more, like on a daily basis or even every Bang that thing out in an you'd hour, You'd think right? that'd be yeah. so easy, but to actually do it well, it's almost impossible. Very few people anywhere can do it well more than once a week. It's kind of it's kind of wild once you actually start, once you actually start trying. Yeah. Okay. Well, then let's bring, let's bring this back then to some of these digital publications that we that we see struggling or or past the point of the, the struggle is over because uh, they were attempting at least some of that because they were existing they were they were they were built in a model or in a period mm -hmm. of time where the content expectations for production were beyond maybe the reality of what could be produced at a qualitative level. You mentioned the the venture component. I think for mm -hmm. our audience going to be familiar with, uh, very wary of digital entities that are not tech companies mm -hmm. trying to adopt a, a venture model that mm -hmm. works for mm -hmm. tech. Like what worked for Facebook and what worked for YouTube and Google is very different than what would work for publications that use those platforms. But there are a lot of uh, big investors that had to discover that the hard way. Yes. But I'm also wondering if that was still tied to an assumption of, uh, or a misunderstanding of how content in those channels and formats are produced relative to to what works here. And, I, and maybe we can speak to some of the specific publications. I don't think we want to necessarily do, you know, how how good was Vice? How good was Gawker? How good was BuzzFeed News? But they were certainly trying to um, yeah. put together a portfolio yeah. of either hard news investigative mm -hmm. plus the the lol cat survey plus you know the yeah. other um here's the latest doug ford photo that will you know uh yeah. drive tons of facebook mm -hmm. clicks types of things yeah they all did wonderful wonderful things the world was better that the world was and is better for having in it um and that's both in terms of the hard journalism and in terms of the perspectives they offered but I can't remember where I was. Can't remember where I was going with this, but um, there. I mean, yeah, no. To think about like all to think of all the different ways they contributed to discourse, they contributed to yeah, they contributed to news, they contributed to information. Um, oh, but but yeah, but even within each of those, once again, like it, there were things that were subsidizing other things. For Gawker, they were doing original investigations for a long time, but they also had. Uh, for a period, it was literally one guy who was just the viral guy, and he would do stuff that would get like the overwhelming majority of traffic on their site, and that would basically prop up the whole operation. Um, Meet San Zimmerman. I looked up Ben Smith, the former editor of uh, editor in chief of BuzzFeed and media report for the New York Times, has a book out about um, about basically the rise and fall of Gawker and BuzzFeed. And uh, weirdly, Meet San Zimmerman's name does not come up in it. Uh, but the, like to me, that that I mean that was the most probably the most stark example of like how a site was for a while was able to successfully use this calculated virality to support its other operations. Whereas, mm -hmm. you know, in BuzzFeed, it was a bit more diffuse. I mean, but they did have, there was the BuzzFeed, I don't know what they called it, but it was like the BuzzFeed content people. There was like the listicles, the quizzes, this yeah, like yeah. quintessential BuzzFeed stuff. And then there was a whole news operation that it effectively subsidized. Um, 
And uh, I mean, I don't not sure the vice to the extent, but I mean, vice was a more diversified and is still a more diversified business with a lot of different arms and a lot of different media and different places in the world. Vice is a weird one because it started in a print format, much more similar to what BuzzFeed Digital was. And then when they went digital, they seemed to lean more into uh, at least a brand of of hard journalism. So like the evolution yeah. of some of these things is I mean, very, very interesting. I mean, right? vice is the weird, has the weirdest history of them all. I mean, vice was always kind of was from the beginning built on on bullshit, right? It was like a, they took over a Haitian community publication in, in Montreal, then turned that into a Montreal weekly, uh, Montreal monthly, and then uh, then took that to the States. And But they, they were always growing through investment, through investment that was built on levels of bullshit. And then, yeah, you're right, only about a decade ago did it start to have serious news ambitions to compete in like more prestigious space as I guess the owners got older and they wanted a different type of respect. Um, sorry, I can't, I can't recall what the question was. No, well, well, well I can take it back. You were talking uh, before about these media publications mm. that um, were uh, rapidly rose, mm -hmm. fueled usually by venture, and they seem to be dying um, at a 10-year cadence, mm -hmm. which is usually the timeline of when ventures like here's mm -hmm. where we want to return, um, at more uh, rapidly than some of the traditional mm -hmm. um media publications that might have still legacy tendrils that mm -hmm. they can maximize uh, or or just are not as beholden to the the frothy sea of the internet algorithms mm -hmm. that these digital media publications mm -hmm. uh, are beholden to. When you did your Now episode, one thing that struck me is that you referenced this as uh, that Now magazine was a story of the slow decay of a publication that mm -hmm. served as the city's internet before the mm -hmm. internet was a thing. And, I, and I'm wondering if there's there, um, even though everything is connected nowadays, that there are still certain, whether it's uh, local media publications mm -hmm. or certain types and formats that just aren't part of that other show going on that allowed for that. When we before we started recording, you were referencing mm -hmm. uh, how it seemed like no one really noticed that now disappeared in the same way mm -hmm. that these other publications are now. At, the, at a certain it, point, BuzzFeed yeah. is very much online. So if they're going to speak about their own demise, they have that mm -hmm. audience and reach. But is there something there in the format or how that decay happened? Yeah, I mean, I think it was what I was hearing from someone who wasn't now late, uh, in the later years. Um, I was at Now Magazine from 2013 to 2017. I got out just before things started to get – I mean, they were already going. We could, It was already clear which direction it was going in. Uh, and then it just kept going in that direction and – kept going in that direction even faster. But um, yeah, hearing that on the inside, what was really hurting and was really, people were really dismayed about was that it felt like no one noticed. No one noticed that it was basically on the verge of going away and that it did in fact go away. And I do think, I don't think it's a personal thing. I think a part of it is because it started, it because it took so long and because it melted mm. over such a long period of time. I mean, um, I believe, like, it's not even clear when they stopped distributing print issues or how widely they were distributing. Like, they, at least in theory, in the start of the pandemic, it's only was restricted. They stopped putting them in boxes. It only went to subway stations. And it just, mm -hmm. it, then at a certain point, they went monthly. It, it was a very slow withering. And you can, you know, measure this in terms of the page counts over the years. It just gradually went down and down and down till it was basically a pamphlet. Whereas something like BuzzFeed, which was built up much more quickly, also went poof much more quickly. Yes. Uh, and so, you know, it was all, there was an opportunity to eulogize it. There was one day everyone knew it would be ending. People could write their think pieces and, and it could eulogize itself in this well, epic oral history. Was there also like a, a culture of that d difference there that would prompt those people to eulogize it in a certain way? Or or did, did the decay kind of bleed that out of people? Because I, you know, uh, in the in the BuzzFeed example, there's, and we'll link to it in the, the show notes, mm -hmm. there's like a 50 billion mm -hmm. word oral history of mostly everyone who ever contributed to BuzzFeed uh, speaking about what that was. It's a, it's a very, uh, very online approach to speaking mm -hmm. to something. What most people might know about Gawker is that it's died three times now in dramatic mm -hmm. fashion. I'm wondering if that willingness to to tweet through the despair is a a function of the digital media publications uh, culturally, or more the fact that when it comes to um, Now Magazine, for, as a way of example, mm -hmm. the 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 demise was so much more of a slow mm -hmm. bloodletting 
that there was no one left with the energy to celebrate it. In in yeah, that, that that's definitely part of it. I do think it was primarily a function of having a known end date. Like right, like when we with this episode of Now Magazine last summer, it was sort of in conjunction with what the you know what the editor at the time had said it was all probably going to be the last ever print issue, and and it was, and it turned out to be. I mean, I guess they could maybe something else, someone else could be printed, but. Uh, but even at the time, there was that uncertainty about it. Like, it wasn't even for sure that that was going to be the last print issue. There was an understanding that it mm. would continue online at least for a bit, and it continued online for another month to fill out commitments through the film festival. And then, you know, one person, the the longtime theater critic, kept just posting and writing reviews, presumably without money, through another few months until it was he was locked out and then the publication's assets were sold off. And so now Toronto does still exist as a very different online digital publication. So even then it's not, it hasn't gone away. Like it, that's the thing is like, it's, yeah, it, it's cause it, it yeah, there, there's, there's no defined end date. And so the, the very idea of having a defined end date for a publication is so weird, but to, but to put to your other point. Yeah. I mean, the people, the handful of people who were <laughs> remaining were, um, you know, so stretched to just put out, issues to actually do the very bare minimum of like, how do we actually get this issue out? That the idea of having a whole other issue that was just self-reflective probably wasn't on the radar. Though I imagine if they, I imagine they would have taken that opportunity if they, if they had been presented, if it yeah. presented itself. And, and, and I don't mean to, to criticize that. I'm just struck mm -hmm. by, by two things. Mm -hmm. The fact that the, um, effectively the wake of Now Magazine was performed mm -hmm. by a former employee who is now the news editor at a publication that's predominantly mm -hmm podcasts but mm -hmm. truly digital but in that episode and, and maybe uh we'll play a clip uh segment from that i was just struck by how exhausted uh your guest was mm -hmm. and 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 no more, no. reflecting how he, uh he wasn't the only one at that publication mm -hmm. where they the that that life force that energy had just mm -hmm. been dragged out of them to the point where um it's truly referring to this is not a a healthy no uh calling uh vocation nine to five job or day to day job certainly not a nine to five and I, I, yeah and in, I mean in his case for example he, Norm Wilner was the longtime film critic there from I think two thousand eight up through about this time last year he got out just before the end he works at TIFF now as a programmer um but he was yet yeah, to go from being a someone who's reviews new movies and whose opinions on, on on pop culture and movies are valued and actually contribute to a discourse about a whole bunch of things to someone who is expected to just, you know, write a roundup of here's what's new on Netflix today. Mm -hmm. I can totally understand why that would be soul crushing as though I, you know, you have one of the greatest jobs in the world and that just that then turns into something where you're just an aggregator. That's that, that's your only value is to try to create, maybe, maybe get clicks if you're lucky. Uh, no, that's a, that's a deeply unhealthy way to to live and to work. And it's ultimately not a successful way to sustain a publication. Yeah. My friends, let's cut to the chase. You're a founder, an entrepreneur. You're hungry, you're fast, you're agile, and you need a legal eagle that matches your pace. The answer, this episode's sponsor, Good Lawyer. Now, this isn't your grandpa's law firm. Good Lawyer is the trusted legal partner of thousands of businesses nationwide, boasting fixed fee legal projects and their revolutionary fractional general counsel. And look, I'm no lawyer. I can't tell you what tort law means, only that it sounds delicious. But when Baedeket found itself in a labyrinth of legalities, Good Lawyer stepped in, delivering results that were as efficient as they were cost effective. Plus, Good Lawyer's fractional general counsel isn't just versed in the law, they become versed in your business. They stand in the trenches with you, offering practical legal advice that fuels your momentum. So visit goodlawyer.ca today to see for yourself and tell them that Beta Kit sent you. Okay, so something I've been thinking about a lot um, this year, I would say over the holidays when I finally got mm -hmm. some time to just mm -hmm. kind of sit down and think, because I've been doing this just to share a bit of my personal history. I've been doing this since about 2004, started in web media, which means I was a, I was a blogger. I came mm -hmm. up in that current of, of new media blogging as a, as a format. I never had a, 
a traditional journalism education mm-hmm. or experience. I never worked at a national daily print publication, anything. I, I always felt completely outside of that. Mm-hmm. And per, certainly for the early to mid 2000s, uh, proudly so, because I, I felt like there was a whole other spectrum of journalism reporting content that could be produced that was, mm-hmm. if not just as valuable, yeah. valuable and wasn't recognized in the way that, um, uh, mm-hmm. you know, I think Candleland had some great episodes on like d- the this dismissive tone towards film or food criticism mm-hmm. in ways that our our service journalism is still valuable but not seen as you know yeah um that having done this for quite some time now i find myself over the holidays just thinking like if i were to start again in 2023 if i were to start completely mm-hmm. over how would i be approaching this and I, I kept coming back to three things i probably wouldn't be looking to run a publication mm-hmm. i probably wouldn't be looking to work for a publication I would probably be looking to to do three things, a sub stack, a podcast, and a YouTube channel. Yeah. And I'm wondering, like we can dig into what that means, but I'm wondering like if you had to start your career again today, oh, how would question. you, well, one, would you still enter journalism? And if so, how would you approach it? That's such a great, such a great question. Um, I mean, I should probably give my own context and background is that i only Please sort do. of backed into journalism well, I, save me from doing it in the intro of the podcast yeah so i um i mean like i, I was like the editor of my high school newspaper and stuff but like that i, I never seriously and i got into writing for journalism but i didn't didn't go i didn't want that i wanted to be a filmmaker um but i got into journalism sort of sideways as a through activism originally i started mm-hmm. doing public space activism at uh, toronto city hall uh, with a group called the toronto, toronto public space committee in 2005 and then started writing about City Hall, uh, first for Torontoist, then for a variety of other places, and doing both of those things sort of simultaneously because I was there was some there was good City Hall coverage at the time, but I was kind of frustrated that there were all the stuff that was missing from it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I loved I loved City Hall. It was both really funny and entertaining and really important. And I love that combination of like, here's a way to get people it's it's very rewarding to pay attention to because there's such characters, there's such smart people and stupid people yelling at each other. It's just great. Uh, and it all and it's all meaningful. It's like entertainment with a purpose. Um, and so I started so I was doing activism and writing at this around the same time. And eventually in 2010, um, which is the election that was ultimately the mayoral election that was ultimately won by Rob Ford, there was a lot of turnover in the various bureaus at City Hall, the various newspapers. They just it was that between mayoral administrations, they took it as an opportunity to switch over the reporters. And a lot of the reporters who were new at the time, I felt really lacked an institutional memory to be able to, mm. for example, properly assess Rob Ford as a candidate, to yes. know that he doesn't, he has a track record, and doesn't deserve the benefit of the doubt, doesn't know the things he's saying are in fact bullshit. Yeah. Um, so yeah, just and then, so, for people who are like not oh, from Toronto, sorry. if the if you you probably heard he's the, the name guy Ron Ford crack. Crack. Yeah, he's the he's the crack mayor. Yes. Uh, you you've, uh, that went international. You were like yeah. I'm, there's a lot of people being like yes, 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 the crack Ch- mayor. Chaotic course. populist man child. Yes. Um but yeah, so even before the crack he was yeah, chaotic populist man child. Um kind of like a kind of like Donald Trump and not quite as cunning and yeah. But but um but um so at that point, I decided I wanted to go like full time into journalism because I felt there was a lot of stuff around that subject matter in particular that was really missing. You you could fill gaps. You could provide value. exactly and tweeting. I mean, it was through largely it was through tweeting. I uh, I was like one of the first people to like live tweet city council meetings in mm-hmm. Toronto, and this was before they were easily live streamable or anything. And what year able, is this? Just to trace some history. Two thousand nine, uh, two thousand ten. Okay, and to be able to just relay stuff going on at city council with context and with humor and with snark frankly and people really grabbed onto that and people really appreciated that and to be able to do it with the the knowledge that i built up from just a few years of already like being involved with it and already reporting on it and writing about it and especially through the 2010 election with that rob ford won and trying to make sense in the early years of rob ford and making sense of that and so it was through twitter weirdly that i built up this profile and then um and various freelance, and then you had various freelance things. Then eventually I was hired by Now Magazine in 2013. And these days, especially, it's pretty unusual to have a sideways route into journalism yeah. like that, which is all of which is to say, how would I do it differently? It's weird because I never really did it. I wouldn't say I didn't. I, I feel like I didn't do it deliberately. Like I was never, I hate the thought of thinking of like, I'm consciously trying to build my brand. Like I don't, I didn't like thinking like that. I mean, that's what I was We're going to get, we're going to get back to that. But, but I, to actually, but to actually get to your very good question, 
I don't know. I don't know. What I will say is that I feel like I would still try to find a way back into journalism because journalism is this weird thing. It's one of very few things that exist that where at its very best, you get all of an opportunity to potentially affect change, Mm -hmm. an opportunity to be creative, indulge creative impulses, uh, an opportunity to be recognized for that and have your name attached to it. So it strokes the ego in that way. And an opportunity to receive a consistent paycheck for doing so. All its very best. At the very best, you get all of those things. <laughs> so and which one of I those have been cut out most prominently in the current, current media environment? Because I, I agree with you. I would also say, you know, adding to that, the addendum would be right now in a, in a misinformation, disinformation mm-hmm. age fueled by social, accurately reporting or um, affecting mm-hmm. your actions towards sharing the best truth that you can seems kind of like a radical act. So there is there mm-hmm. is kind of a pushing against the current social tides elements mm-hmm. to it in the best case here, but which, which it seems like when you're listing that out in the best case, I don't I don't know if we have even anywhere close to that best case. I think I mean we we do, but I mean we're always sort of cha- we're always sort of everyone who's in journalism is kind of chasing that, trying to chase mm-hmm. that, con- that juncture where you get to do all those things, and those jobs do exist. There's just very 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 few of them, mostly. In Canada, they're mostly like the Globe and Mail, for example, or the CBC. But even these places have fewer and fewer. Um, I mean, but every, I mean, once again, any good journalism job, any really good journalism job has all of them. It's just there are very, very few of them. And frankly, you're probably, I mean, you know, you're just as likely to be able to like direct a feature film at that point. Like it, it, it's, yeah. it's like winning. It's like a lottery win at this point. Yes. But okay. if you're in journalism, chances are, I mean, and you're serious about it, chances are you have this the combination of personality traits that wants each of those four things satisfied. And so regardless of how much more difficult it becomes, you're still going to be trying to chase that. Yeah. It's interesting. You said something like it, it's harder now to get into journalism sideways, yeah. which I think is a function of like fewer opportunities yeah but i also feel like it might be even harder still to go through the direct route for the reasons you're saying because my understanding of the traditional modality is that you you go to a prominent j school you do an internship you cut your teeth in the newsroom learning on the job and the the people that can survive that trial by fire Mm -hmm. get to stay Humber College just recently paused their admissions for Bachelor of Journalism oh. uh, due to declining enrollment. Hmm. Same for the University of Virginia, and I have it on good authority that Carleton is also having problems. Carleton's my alma mater, but I didn't study at the J School program. Oh. I'm a student of the humanities uh, because in 2004, when I was running a digital publication that had a couple hundred thousand monthly views, I couldn't go to an education program that actually taught web mm-hmm. editing or yeah. like what knew what WordPress was yeah. back then. Um, so I'm wondering what you would tell aspiring journalists, young people today that are that are, have been going through that process and are now just graduating or were considering that process for the same motivations that you would have. Because I know the young journalists in my sphere are absolutely terrified by yeah. the state of media, um, not only because of all the reasons that you listed up, but just maybe as they're, en- they're entering a moment where most uh, media news is about publications dying. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm just wondering like what what you would say, you know, beyond your younger self, what you would say to current people right now who are dealing with that circumstance as well. I mean, I think the probably the, I think the best general advice for up and coming journalists, and this is something I've been sort of been saying for a while, is at least for the first while, find a, not, find a way to make money that is not, journalism and it's mm. to support the journalism for me and that's not something i talk about very often but like i, I the, when i was freelancing um, the majority of my income came from working in box offices for film and theater festivals uh which i enjoyed doing I enjoyed, ancillary benefits for sure exactly yeah. i enjoyed that's a, it's a, it's a it's a great way to do tiff it's a great way to do the fringe festival and that was and it's fun you get to work with like actor a lot of the people a lot of people most of the people in those jobs are actually like actors or musicians and it was fun being like the, the journalist in that just because other people who have sort of sort of basically artistic creative gig work um but to be able to find something else to actually support that so that Something you know, yes, yeah, something else so that you can actually you know take the time and 
because you're not going to, I guess it's virtually impossible to make a, a full living as a full-time freelancer these days. Mm. It's extremely difficult. Very, unless very you are already have the prominence where you're relying yeah. upon that kind of brand, right? Yeah. You can even then very, even then very few people do. And most, even most of them, you know, maybe teach on the side or have mm -hmm. some corporate editing gig. Uh, in my last year before working for now magazine, I was doing, um, copy editing for the Trump hotel in Toronto which is freaking, which is so freaking weird. I had a friend who was somehow got into running the marketing there, and so we're just giving like tossing off like freelance contracts to her friends. In the politest way, I mean that is kind of on brand for you as an interesting counterpoint to all yeah. the other things that you do. I actually think it hits your, oh, okay, your cool. sphere pretty well. Like I would, I would keep that on your LinkedIn. Like I actually did some Trump Hotel. Oh yeah, I adds to the mystique a bit. Yeah, I mean, it's weird. I don't, I don't, I mean, it's like, I've never like hidden, like I've mentioned, like I've written about it in Now Magazine once or twice, but, uh, but like, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's one of the things I remember once in a while, like, oh, that was, that was weird. Um, but, uh, that's, that's just generally the advice I would give and the advice I would give for a long time is don't, is you, unless you were one of those rare people with the stamina to just churn things as churn out really good things, just churn things out at all. Don't try to make a full-time go of it in, in freelancing or in journalism. The other advice, um, I don't know, because we all I also would have said try to create some sort of try to establish yourself as some sort of unique voice on a particular given subject matter to the best of your ability. But I mean, with I, I wouldn't advise anyone to premise their career prospects on Twitter at the moment, mm. right? Like for a long time, and this was one of the angles that I had, and the, a lot of people, it's like to be able to establish yourself as someone who is funny, smart witty and knowledgeable but a very specific subject and become an authority in that uh, of that on twitter which is where journalists spend a disproportionate amount of time you will there's a strong chance of getting noticed that way uh and for a long time for about a decade i would say that was actually a viable way to sort of start to put yourself out there and sort of yeah. show up and compete in that same sphere uh, but I, once again, like with, with what happened with, with Twitter now, I would not advise putting your eggs in that basket. I don't know what comes next though. Uh, everyone's, everyone's signing up to all the different platforms. Hopefully there is a mm -hmm. sex, but I agree with you because it, it provided a, you a, a network mm -hmm. It provided you distribution and it provided you sources. Yes. Um, but I would say that that's really the only place where I've saw journalists in the past 10 years really lean into something that aided their careers mm -hmm. as journalists beyond just filing the big stories. I want to go back to something mm -hmm. you said before where you were like, you kind of re recommend to journalists that they have to kind of build their brand a bit. And there was an acknowledgement that there's like, ah, there's a little bit mm -hmm. of attention there. One of the things that has struck me in the last 10 to 15 years prior to the move to Substack was it just seemed like there's this... I think for good reason, intentional divide between the work of journalism and the business of journalism. And most of the longtime mm -hmm. journalists I know, particularly ones that worked at national dead tree publications or whatever, uh, saw their function as very much like a, a industrial punch the clock in and out. I, I we we ship the the news widgets each day. There's mm -hmm. significant value in that, but I'm I'm keeping my mm -hmm. Um, eyes off of the state of the the industry. And I was always surprised to the extent that journalists would not lean into having a better understanding of new formats, experimentation, um, hmm. any sort of consideration of of where the business of media might be going. I'm wondering how much that relates to the formats that those journalists were working to or this maybe like cultural inhibition towards the brand building that is mm -hmm. like individual journalists now are their own media brands yeah. or media entities. Do you see that shifting or changing? It was, was my description of the, the prior conception accurate in terms uh, of. I mean, it, 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 it varied. Um, I think it's, I think in that respect, it's largely, it's largely a generational slash cultural thing. Okay. I think the big shift did come about because of Twitter and early Twitter. Not just because Twitter, but I think that was a big part where, I, I, sorry, I guess it's acknowledged. Like I think I think we take for granted now that like I mean everyone has has opinions, everyone has a worldview, everyone has mm -hmm. their own bias, even if it's just in favor of the status quo. Everyone, everyone has an everyone has an ideology that they're bringing something to, and um, regardless of how objective you aim to make a given piece of journalism, and I think what Twitter was very successful at was for even 
straight news journalists or hard news journalists, it allowed them to carve out, allowed them to sort of share a sense of their own personality and if not views or if not opinions necessarily, then still their views in the sense of what analysis or experience or expertise do they bring to a given thing. Like everyone looks at something in a particular way. And I think the something comes through more as an individual voice on Twitter than it, than it maybe it did. Oh, 100% in, because it's fundamentally exactly. separating the output of their work from the mm-hmm. publication that they were beholden to. Like it, it, mm-hmm. you're totally right. It seems weird to say right now, mm-hmm. but like it is a fundamental change in the last 10 years that a vast majority of news, whether it's political, sports, mm-hmm. entertainment, whatever, is first published to social media before journalistic publications pick it up, often by the journalists that work for those publications Mm -hmm. to the point where there have been tons of publications that have like adopted some sorts of like, you know, file first before you tweet Mm -hmm. policies that never seem to go very well. But just the idea that the the channel, the the Mm -hmm. media entity now is that journalist's social channel Mm -hmm. beyond the publication, I think... You're totally right. Was the yeah. first fracturing of that kind of relationship, mm-hmm. and to be able to regard like, and I think then something that certainly journal publications play up now is like, here's who the individual journalist is. Here's a photo of them. Here's who they are. What they're reporting for us is not just some sort of unknown byline. Because I think people have that quite recently have the expectation. There's no. There's no longer. It's harder to think of something as sort of like, um, you know just a generalized voice of a publication or of a newswire, you think of them, it's harder to not think of them as individuals, which I think is a very healthy thing for media consumption. Um, Why? Because as I said, like everyone, because I, I think it's, it was a, it was always a weird mistake to believe that there was any th- real thing of kind of objectivity and that, Mm. Uh, and that people weren't bringing their own ideologies to whatever they're doing, regardless of how much they want to or not. Um, because I think it, because subjectivity or so, because objectivity was always, if not a lie, then I think a misleading concept because things are written by individuals. Things are edited by individuals. Things are published by individuals. It's not just the voice, some you know disembodied voice. And to have a better idea of the context, I think is always helpful. Yeah, I, I get that. I just feel like it was much better if we were to subconsciously acknowledge that rather than any time we see a report have to be reminded that whether or not that reporter does good work, they're also probably a dink. Like, yeah, you now have to consider whether Glenn Glenn Greenwald, Mm -hmm. Jesse Brown, me, like my behavior in online in conjunction with our work mm-hmm. and and i i think there we kind of lost something when a newsroom full of crazy psychopathic sincere hard-working determined journalists could produce something th- like that that the person or not the personalities but the the personal attributes are removed and i i also think it's it's a real danger to um uh minority uh representational mm-hmm. reporters right now where you just see it in Canada or oh, yeah, across absolutely. North America where they're, it's almost easier now to attack their personality first beyond ever. Like they can't hide mm-hmm. behind. There's the age of the economist, each reporter hiding behind the publication's mm-hmm. brand and not having the byline is like fundamentally gone. Mm-hmm. And there seems to be no new defense barrier. The, there's so mm-hmm. much a greater burden on the individual reporters, mm-hmm. the individual channels of distribution yes. now to do all of those things. I mean, I mean, individuals, I mean, yeah, to be clear, I'm not saying that people have to necessarily put themselves out on social media, but that as a result of yeah. people putting themselves out on social media, publications now all sort of acknowledge reporters as individuals. Uh, but yeah, no, it, I, I would also, but I guess I would also say that it is through this champ, you know, the people championing th- through these people, ap- people acting at, or presenting themselves as individuals, that they were also able to, uh, ironically, almost act collectively <laughs> in terms mm-hmm. of being able to advocate for more change successfully within newsrooms in ways that people had had much more difficulty obtaining traction with, uh, obtaining, obtaining traction with uh, doing it internally for a long time. Like there's been a lot of, I think there's, I think there's been positives in terms of being able to obtain accountability so, even within one's own organization via Twitter. And so agreed. although it leads to, it leads to all kinds of more hor- hor- horrific abuse, I think it's also in, provided, at least did in the past, provide the tools for people to 
shift cultures or obtain more power in the first place. Yeah. When I mentioned my, hey, media in 2023 is a, a, a YouTube, a sub stack and a podcast, you kind of nodded, but then also maybe had a bit of a Ooh, yeah, reaction. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering if well, you could- Well, that's a fun thing with the video, with a video podcast, people can like see my body language. Yes. Yes. <laughs> it's Which I'm also then calling out yeah. for the audio listeners. Exactly. Who are exactly. Like, what are you guys, <laughs> when, what, why did we pivot to video? It's uh, we're, it's a it's a brave new world we're in, folks. Um, I'm looking at, I don't even know if the right camera, there's like 30 cameras here. Hopefully Poncho will help me we're out cutting here. Through all, cutting through yes. all of them. Yeah. Um, well, you had some, you said something brilliant before. It's like, can we do a matrix bullet time yeah, thing with this technology. Yeah, because there's six uh, Canon EOS 90Ds in a row. And if you theoretically got a frame grab from each, you'd have a very rudiment, at the simultaneous frame grab from each, you'd have a very rudimentary bullet time yes. shot where you could of, just like- Of the least around. action oriented. Yes. <laughs> um, okay, but to that point, I'm wondering, I, I, wanna, I wanna lock in on maybe uh, why you reacted in that way, but then also mm -hmm. prompt you with maybe a, a positive definition of that is what business models are working <laughs> right now? What are you seeing? Like, what are the the positive examples of where media should be as a, uh, a publication and a business in 2023? <laughs> so it's, this is always a fun question. It's always a fun thing to consider because you can find... Any, pub any publication that's dying or has died, you could probably go to some point in the past and find a time when they were cited as the future of media or yes. a viable business model. Usually so, in their own press release about that. Uh, yeah, but not, but, but I mean, I, I would expect people to say that in their own press release. It's when other people credulously adopt that, that's gets fun, it becomes funnier or more concerning. Uh, so I feel like anything I could cite now could just, <laughs> could, could just, just, could just as easily go away or not easily, but like you know, it could become the fodder of, of conversation 10 years from now about like, <laughs> well, that was, that was naive. Um, what is working now? I mean, obviously if you're, if you're the biggest player in the given market uh, and or owned by an exceedingly rich person who preaches as a vanity project, that still seems to be viable. The Globe gotcha. and Mail still uh, will be the last, will be the last one standing in Canada. It is made for an audience it's very self-consciously made for an elite audience for a business audience and it's owned by a very rich person who doesn't want to lose money on it but is willing to put you know it's to have it as it's a prestige thing yeah uh similarly uh in the states i mean jeff bezos on the ones the washington post uh new york times is the biggest thing they're able to take advantage of that scale um but i mean given that most things are not given that most things are by definition not the biggest thing in their respective spheres yes God, if we had answers, like, like we this, can't if, all if, work if we, at the New York Times, no, right? Uh, as much as we all like to, no. If we, all, if we, I mean, if I, I don't, I don't. Uh, <laughs> well, I'm not saying I wouldn't like to work at the New York Times, um, but I, I also made a very conscious decision in 2011 when I stopped working for tech companies mm. to not move to um, the U.S. to work for. Mm. Like I worked at BlackBerry. Many of my colleagues. I'm sorry, left. I didn't know that. I should have, should have Googled you first. It's totally fine. Uh, our listeners have a variety of uh, very existential podcasts where I I go through trauma therapy for that uh, period of time. But when when I left that company, many of my colleagues were leaving to Google, Samsung, Apple, U.S. giants, mm -hmm. and then some stayed because they wanted to live and build in Canada. I had a similar when I wanted to bounce back to media. I'm like, am I am I going to move to New York and work for The Verge? No, I want to, there is Canadian mm. media coverage for tech that needs mm. to happen here. So I, 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 while I would love to have a byline in the New York Times and do that work and, and learn from those people and be part of that newsroom and probably get like just great newsroom snacks, I would assume. Um, there, I do want to just speak for a moment mm. to the the need for for local not that you're just yeah. like you work for canada land man like mm -hmm. so there's there's a component here. i just i just wanted yeah. to put that out there yeah i i, I love i mean a lot of things like the times the arts coverage i mean there's not like uh, the, the very there are very few places in the world that have multiple people right full-time on staff writing about theater <laughs> so that's that's what that um that's an allusion is partly to but um is it is big the only way that that happens like these days, yeah. I mean, uh, I mean, well, yeah. So, I mean, arts coverage is something something that I spend a lot of time looking at and thinking about, and strict, like wistfully, it, almost. It, yeah, moment, and it, yeah. in Canada right now, there is, to my knowledge, exactly one person who has a full time job uh, writing about theater. I guess full time staff job at, at a news organization writing about theater. Um, like but we we have more people working full time reporting about tech than the Globe and Mail. Like it's. 
it's it is uh dark and difficult yeah. out there right now i mean yeah in the uk that the situation theater situation is better but like yeah it's it's kind of yeah there there are whole beats that have basically dis yeah that have disappeared and that if you want to if you would like to cover something as your life there just aren't places to go do that i mean that, that the, um but okay so we got super high net worth individuals yeah super high net worth individuals, tech people. just giant scale i mean you know, I feel weird, it's like citing Canada land because you know, good once again, like for the reason, like goodness knows what the future holds for anything. But I think one thing, especially in retrospect, that has served it relatively well is that it never built up very quickly. It's mm. been around; it'll be it'll, the tenth. It's hitting its tenth anniversary uh, this this fall, and. It's been a very gradual scaling up over those 10 years. Maybe, you know, you, you certainly it's easier to second guess now, maybe more gradual than it ought to have been. With the new editor-in-chief, right? Yeah, with the new editor-in-chief, Karen Pugliese, starting in July. Um, but the staff now, it's about, I think it depends on how you count, it's about 20, including part-time people, 15 or 16 not. And... Um, Unlike a lot of places, especially a lot of newer media places that do have a lot of upfront investment to build a really great quality product first and then try to then hope that attracts attention and, uh, you know, Vine becomes becomes sustainable. Candleland is only sort of scaled up in conjunction with the support we've received from subscribers and from supporters and from advertising. And so it's never really, as to my knowledge, it's never really outgrown it's it's basically there wasn't the sort of upfront investment where then the revenue is trying to catch up to it yes it was it's basically scaled up in conjunction with or in parallel to the revenue which so far has left us on relatively stable footing whether like you know whether how this would work like i don't know I mean, but of course once again like this is not a way to if the toronto star goes away tomorrow there is nothing that would replace it there is nothing that could scale like, mm -hmm. you would start up that is at that scale and there's nothing that currently exist that would ever be able to scale up to that so but we could have five cannon lands tomorrow if people were intended but it's well you know you could have five cannon lands at like an early version yes. of it like a five like three people five cannon lands of like three people each and then you have you know maybe you have like a a, a sports section of a paper right yeah. i like it, it's 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 I, I don't know how you achieve that scale again. Okay. So the that third option that you were kind of speaking to is the Substack long tail individual. Like we we mm -hmm. we make this up in the aggregate, and and build off of uh, viable scaling from the smallest possible sustainable version up until mm -hmm. what it can handle. Because um, I, I noted before in some of the other options you were speaking to, it's like, well, you know, traditionally it's always been these publications. While they monetized off their journalism, they always had some additional cachet of revenue. Mm -hmm. And and what we're seeing with the the subsacks and or the the smaller independent publications is starting with what they mm -hmm. can afford to deliver and growing from there. I will note, I I, I can't help but note that Canon Land partially started because the founder put some cash into a tech company that exited providing an opportunity for that. So there is there is a maybe not an ultra high net worth component to that, but there is the like. Yeah, it's, I mean, I will say that. Well, I guess I I don't know. My under what Jesse has made what Jesse has maintained is that he did so he, that he did not put any of that money into Candleland. He definitely put his time into Candleland as much as he worked for for free for at least the first year, and then he didn't get a lot in sal. I don't. I, mean, I didn't get a lot in salary for the first mm -hmm. several years. Um, obviously, yes, his own. Uh, general life circumstances were able to support that it's kind of the same but in thing terms we, of but in terms of whether it's actually the snapchat money i think that was he's been key kept that as like a, a separate pot actually i feel like i, should, I don't know but basically there's he, a he's episode that, that, that we can link yeah. to and he yeah. speaks to it oh, okay. um I, yeah i don't think he's ever revealed the dollar amount but but just to that point of there there were it wasn't just enough to push a button launch a thing and I, I maybe even speaks to the difference between 10 years ago to now it's much easier for someone to launch a substack and start mm -hmm. with that than than having that initial yeah. motivation with with beta kit when we spun that out as, as its own company for me, it was a personal loan. It was the same thing. What? What? Actually, yeah, I'll say if it's the Snapchat. Basically, in it was, as far as I'm aware, it wasn't seed capital, but it was more like personal cushioning. Yes, to to be able to take the yes. risk and to to kind of leap off the cliff. Um, okay, so we've got we've got three options here, which isn't that 
good, no. that bad. I'm, I'm wondering. I mean, the other. We, mm -hmm. Oh, I was just going to say, can we go back to your reaction of, mm -hmm. do you think that that's a good thing that, that new entrants today are looking to do the YouTube podcast um, Substack thing or I think, am I reading too much into what I, I saw think then? it's no I, I think it's I, I was thinking like now I'm thinking like oh god it's so much work I feel like once you at least once you hit your 30s the idea of, do, of trying to build up that much in terms of a personal brand I feel like that's like very early 20s energy or very mid 20s mm -hmm. energy is like yeah I could I could do that I what I have to say is important and people will pay to hear that and now I'm like oh god I, that seems like a lot of work uh, to put myself out there that much but um, also just it still would still make me nervous to rely on such specific platforms right um i know not that i can tell you what the alternative is because you know publications is a specific platform too but you know substack could just change one thing tomorrow youtube does just change one thing tomorrow these they could just a company could just decide to just you know do something different <laughs> and yeah. then you know a huge chunk of your income is wiped away so obviously spreading yourself around through different opportunity different things is a good way is by definition, hedging your bets, but um, I would still be so nervous about like, I don't know, about building something up on another platform that could just collapse. But I guess what it was well, again, like that's true of going to work for any publication, I guess. Yeah. And maybe to, cause I'm it's not like I thought this was going to be a very positive episode, but to tie it back to something that you said there, it's much easier to do that. If that is a, if that calling and that work is a side thing, Mm -hmm. in conjunction to another thing that pays the bills for you. Yeah. To, and it's not a full leap. It is, a, um, you know, in the same way that a lot of people open up a Shopify store to mm -hmm. sell knit hats. Yeah, I mean, the pandemic and things like that. I mean, a fun thing with like, is it like we're, we're working in box offices is that it's a short, intense period and you can make like it, you're working many, many, many hours over a handful of weeks around a festival and then it leaves the rest and then you get a bunch of money that you can use the rest of the month to <laughs> try to try to write a column about uh i don't know lobbying at city hall or whatever is there anything that you're paying attention to right now looking forward when it comes to hmm. either publications that might be next on the chopping block or oh, okay. positive things that you're hoping to see change give me give me a, yeah. maybe a go for perspective here as we, as we um, speak to the potential death of digital media in Canada, I am constantly afraid for the big city dailies, especially those that are owned by Post Media. Um, Post Media is Canada's largest newspaper company. Their National Post is their flagship paper, but they also run the major dailies in Vancouver, Calgary, Edmonton, uh, Saskatchewan, Regina, uh, the major English language daily in Montreal. Um, and I think they, yeah, um, and they've recently gotten to Atlantic stuff as well. Oh, and Ottawa. And those papers have gotten thinner and thinner. They're, they, if you just flip through them, like you flip through these Saskatchewan papers, it's really remarkable how they're down to a skeleton staff. And most of the content in these papers are, is either, is, is why their wire copy is shared from some other post media paper, reprinted from elsewhere. You could literally open up a, a you know, a, newspaper for a city of several hundred thousand people and have exactly it's a full newspaper but have exactly one article that's original to yeah. that newspaper and especially as they give up their offices in the different cities it's really unclear what will happen if suddenly like it's weird to think of a large city without a daily newspaper all uh, right like what is the news gathering operation there maybe they have a small cbc operation maybe they have a small ctv or global operation maybe they have some radio news but to have to not have that is very is very weird and very strange and i guess many small cities and small towns have gone through that quite a lot over the past two decades uh but to, we're about to get to the place where even large cities are without news gathering operations and that's really concerning for all the usual you know death of dem or uh, fraying democracy reasons we could talk about yeah um in terms of what's encouraging, I'm, I don't know, I, I find myself thinking a little bit more about La Presse, which might be one of the, the most successful digital publications in Canada now, because it was a newspaper for a long time, it was a print newspaper. And I think the final print edition of any day of the week was just, just several years ago, but it's really somehow succeeded as, as it, it continues as a newspaper, but just online. 
And they have a you know tablet edition La Presse Plus, which the Toronto Star very unsuccessfully tried to mm-hmm, duplicate mm-hmm. as Star Touch. Um, and I don't know. I mean, Quebec media cultural ecosystem is different from the rest of Canada in many different ways. They consist like they are able to sustain a, a movie, a movies, and a star system, a celebrity system in ways that English Canada absolutely has not. Yes. Um, so there's a lot of stuff there that makes that's unique to that province. But I do find it fascinating that like. Had the National Newspaper Awards a couple years ago, or a couple years ago, a couple weeks ago, the Globe and Mail dominated as they always do, but La Presse was like in second, pretty close mm. second, winning in like a ton of different categories across uh, many different types of reporting. And I just, it's a weird, we just I had to remind myself, like, this is, I had, I, I, during the ceremony, I had to look on Wikipedia to double check, like, this really isn't in print anymore, is it? And so I don't know, I feel like. I'm not sure exactly how that model manages to work, but they they do seem to be the one place that's managed to become a very successful post-print newspaper. Yeah. And to your original point, uh, not only have they cultivated an audience that would very much miss them if they were gone, um, seems to not allow them to disappear by continued mm-hmm. support. And and I think that's something that every publication needs to be looking at right now. Mm-hmm. I hope you are, I don't know if I hope that you're wrong about continued slow decay at some of the publications you indicated, but I, I at least hope we see some new options uh, available to us, not only as like citizens in democracy, but as, as members of mm-hmm. the news media. And I would I would love to have you back and talk about those yeah. Uh, either either to hold fresh wakes or to look at a uh, new entrance. Yeah, no, I'd love to and look at all everything I said today and find out if it, like was I on the money or was I just totally way off and could we just make fun of that now? <laughs>